Nobody was going to tell me. Not one of you was going to let me know. You all saw my old videos when I looked like a bright, fresh-faced little boy. And then you saw me get a new camera. And I didn't know that the lighting wasn't going to be the same with the new camera. And I came up in here looking like a flippin' ghost. And nobody was going to tell me that that's wrong. I just had to figure it out for myself. Well, I haven't. I'm still figuring out how the lights work. I'm still doing it wrong. I've tried new things. It's probably better. But now, this is just what you have to deal with. I appreciate you being polite. But a word of advice on friendship. When you see your man looking like a gosh darn ghoul, you should let him know. For real though, I do have a friend who's a videographer who I'm gonna ask for some help with this, but if anybody has any tips in the comments down below on how to make like these LED lights better than what they are, I'd appreciate it. Is that better? I adjusted some things. I turned these down and I moved that one a little bit more. It looks better on the viewfinder over here. See, I don't know. I'm just embarrassed. Welcome back to Reacteria. I am genuinely excited to get started on this video because what I'm reacting to today looks awesome. One of my subscribers sent it to me. It's called Destroying Evolution with Five Key Points by The Kennedy Report. Now this is published through a channel called The Fatima Center and the description here says, please help us spread the saving message of Our Lady of Fatima. I have no idea what that means. So I looked it up and apparently Our Lady of Fatima is another way of saying like the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, but it's the Portuguese way of saying that. Like I guess it's a, it's, it's a thing in Portugal. So if anybody out there is Catholic or knows about Catholicism and understands why an American channel would be using a Portuguese saint uh, person here as like their figurehead and you want to let me know down in the comments below probably don't now nah, I'm just teasing I always love learning new stuff so send me whatever you want but for real though this video looks awesome because it's only 25 minutes long and it's five key points to destroy evolution and in my experience whenever you have like that set list that like five big things crammed into a little video like this it's either really really interesting or really really bad and given the history of this channel I feel like it's gonna be pretty bad <laughs> but I don't want to prejudge this video we are gonna give this one a fair shake before we do that however you know I gotta shout out my patrons my patrons on patreon are the reason why this dream is a reality they help me worry less about food, and so I'm able to worry a little bit more about studying and making these videos. And that means more to me than I can possibly express. And some of them are in my Science Probably book club, where I occasionally send out books which may or may not be about science. And they're about to receive this book called Evolution in Four Dimensions. This is an amazing read. It helped me out a lot in grad school to understand things like niche construction and behavioral evolution. And this is the revised edition. My copy is not the revised edition. Yes, I am jealous. Yes, I did consider sending one of you my old scribbled in copies and keeping one of these for myself. No, I did not succumb to that greed. You're welcome. I'm sending these books out the day before I make this video public. So if you're watching this and you're in the Science Probably Book Club, this will be in your mailbox soon. And with that out of the way, let's get started on the video. We're going to destroy evolution in five key points. Can't wait. So we're actually going to sort of do a one-stop shop. This is a big topic. Uh, we could talk about this for hours. For very specific information on this, I suggest that you visit the Colbay Center. We did an interview with Pam Acker, who works with the Colbay Center on vaccination. All right, hold the phone, wait a second. So I just looked up this Colbay Center, and here it is, the Colbay Center for the Study of Creation, a Catholic apostolate dedicated to proclaiming the truth about the origins of man and the universe, and their top story here is, Would Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life Redound to the Glory of God? Yeah, they really do seem to have all their ducks in a row, don't they? And I just looked up the vaccination thing they were talking about, Vaccination, a Catholic Perspective, produced by biologist Pamela Aker, 
Drawing upon the latest research in the field, Ms. Aker elucidates the many problematic aspects of vaccination as currently practiced and explains how they flow out of a materialistic, mechanistic, evolution-based understanding of the human person, which tends to see man as a collection of parts rather than a divinely designed body-soul composite. With powerful examples, she shows how the evolution-based approach to the study of disease has had disastrous consequences for scientific and medical research and has supported the maintenance of inadequate criteria for evaluating the efficacy and the dangers of vaccination as currently practiced. So they're anti-vaxxers too. I did not expect to be this grossed out this quickly into this video. Holy crap. Wonderful people over there. They do wonderful work talking about the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation, but also just debunking the myths about evolutionary theory from just a strictly scientific perspective. It's not that hard to do. There's a mountain of resistance, but it's not actually that sophisticated. So we're oh, don't worry. There is not a doubt in my mind that this is not going to be that sophisticated. With something so... Uh, grandiose and all-encompassing as this evolutionary theory has societal implications, academic implications, religious implications, and so forth. We better be sure about it, because if we're wrong, we're basically just promulgating a massive myth. We agree there. It has huge implications, and we'd better be right about it. Good thing there are mountains of evidence. We're going to go through five key points. So number one, the Big Bang. The Big Bang has nothing to do with evolution, so great start. You've heard of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is the idea that 13-ish... 13.8. ...billion years ago, maybe longer, uh, depending on the theory and depending on what year they decide to tweak the numbers, because it's all settled, by the way. No, it is settled. It's just 1 over Hubble's constant. That does move because... So... We know that galaxies exist out in space, right? And we can see how far away they are. And we can also see that they're moving away from us. We can tell how fast they're moving away from us by measuring the redshift of the light that's coming off of those galaxies. And when you plot graphically the distance of those galaxies and the velocity that they're moving away from us, you come up with a remarkably straight line. These things are directly proportional. And this makes sense because of the whole raisin bread model of the universe, where if you think about the universe like a big lump of raisin bread dough, any two raisins would be two galaxies. If they're close together, as the bread is rising or baking, then those galaxies are going to spread apart as the bread expands in between them. The farther away the two raisins are, the more bread there is in between them to expand, so they're going to move away faster than two that are close together with only a little bit of expanding bread in there. So with two galaxies that are super far apart, there's more space that is expanding in between them, and so they move away faster. So we have this line, which is plotting the distance of these galaxies against the velocity at which they're moving away. The slope of that line, which you remember how to calculate slope, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? The slope of that line is called Hubble's constant which, if I remember correctly, is written as h with a subscript 0. If I'm wrong about that, I will correct myself in the editing here. The slope of that line is called Hubble's constant. And with Hubble's constant, we can express that direct proportionality as an equation, which is that velocity is equal to Hubble's constant times distance. That is called Hubble's law. Now here's the cool part. If you're good at algebra, you can take a really simple equation like that and rearrange all the parts of it, and you can come up with a new equation. And that new equation is that 1 over Hubble's constant is equal to distance over velocity. In physics, distance over velocity is time. So 1 over Hubble's constant equals time. Not like the time of whatever. The concept of time is 1 over Hubble's constant. The whole time that the universe has been a thing. And when you calculate that, you get a number that's around 14 billion years. Now the truth of the matter is, Hubble's constant is still something that's being refined. As we gather more data and measure more galaxies, the slope of that line gets a little closer and closer to reality. And there's also other measurements that we could be taking. More refined mathematics that we could be using. We can measure the total energy of the whole universe using methods that are way outside of my wheelhouse. And when we pile all of those data together, we come up with better and better numbers. And that's why our understanding of the age of the universe has changed a little bit over the past few decades. But we're not talking about like, maybe it's 13 billion years, maybe it's 800 billion years. We're talking like, 
Is it 13.84 or is it 13.37? We're arguing over little decimal places right now. So for this guy to put this point out here that it's just completely hopeless and that we have no idea what we're talking about and that it's all just guesswork and you just have to believe whatever the scientists say we believe next, that's madness. It makes zero sense and it would be totally dishonest if this person knew what he was talking about, which I am not convinced of yet. Uh, there's this idea that basically the universe popped out of nothing and from there we have what they call the Big Bang. Okay, well, that answers that question immediately. This person has no idea what he's talking about. In reality, I've heard some scientists say it wasn't really an explosion, but that's sort of a metaphor. Some say that it's more like an expansion of light. It doesn't matter. It very matters. You just explained why the thing that you just said a second ago makes no sense. You paraphrased it really poorly, but you did put it in there and then deliberately ignored it and said that it doesn't matter. It's actually quite simple to find a way to debunk this idea of the Big Bang. And you might be asking yourself, why am I talking about the Big Bang and evolution? I am asking myself that, yes. Well, the Big Bang is basically just evolution in the heavens, and it's actually necessary for this whole mentality that we follow with evolutionary theory. What? So the idea that there was a universe that popped out of nothing. Well, here's the problem. If you look into the basic consensus on what Big Bang cosmologists will um, posit about this theory. In essence, there are elements that are present at the time of this Big Bang. There are also forces that are necessary, like gravity, to cause the environment to be such that you could have this uh, massive pressure, which leads to these things for the expansion. But the problem with that is, in order to have these elements, you're going to need something like star fusion, which will create these elements. So if you have something like star fusion that can create elements, then you have to have things like stars. In order to have things like stars, you're gonna to have to have something like a universe, which means ultimately you're gonna to have to explain to me how the Big Bang started from nothing, but at the same time it also needed a universe to begin. The Big Bang didn't start with all of the elements. It didn't even start with some of the elements. It started with none of the elements. And then as soon as matter had cooled down enough, to condense just a little bit, it formed the simplest elements, hydrogen and helium. Helium is non-reactionary, but hydrogen makes stars. Those stars then make other heavier elements. You said yourself that stellar nucleosynthesis, or as you call it, star fusion, is required to make the heavier elements. The Big Bang happened, then hydrogen happened, then stars happened, and then the rest of the elements happened. It's not the elements and then the Big Bang and then the stars. That would make no sense. That's why nobody's saying that. I've also heard scientists say, I think Stephen Hawking said it, because of the force of gravity, the universe can create itself from nothing. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, but how can there be a force of gravitation, which is clearly a force within the universe, according to these scientists, if there is no universe to have this force in the first place. If you really get into the logic of the Big Bang, it crumbles pretty quickly. Yeah, I've heard that quote. Gravity is a function of the shape of the universe. It is a force that's made apparent by the bending of space-time. That's one of the reasons why it doesn't have a carrying particle like all the other forces do. And that's one of the things that Hawking was talking about when he said that quote is that it is in the very nature of the universe to create itself. And another thing that he was talking about with that is something that Lawrence Krauss wrote in his book, A Universe from Nothing, that the dominant energy of the universe lies in empty space. And our current understanding of gravity and of quantum physics has shown us that empty space can create itself out of nothing. And that is one of the many reasons why the words of Niels Bohr still ring true today. If quantum physics hasn't profoundly shocked you yet, you haven't understood it yet. And in fairness to those who advocate for it and do um, essentially uh, consider these things, you start to see these ideas of, well, the Big Bang was just one sort of creation event in a series of them where there's sort of this going out and coming back and whatever. You start to sound a little bit crazy going around the rabbit hole a little bit too much. That's an extremely outdated idea. That's called the Big Crunch Model. 
This idea that there's the big bang and then it all crunches back in and then goes out and in and out and in over and over. That only works in a closed universe. We don't live in a closed universe. We live in a flat universe, which is why our universe is going to end in a heat death, not in a big crunch. And if you don't know the difference between a closed universe and a flat universe, you probably need to quit talking about the Big Bang because you're not doing anybody any favors. The Big Bang makes no sense logically. You can do all of the sort of sophisticated mathematic and documentaries and CGI stuff you want, but if you're going to tell me that the universe began from nothing, but you have to have something in order to have nothing, then you start to sound like a crazy person. It's just a reality. Yes, saying that would make you sound like a crazy person. Fortunately, nobody's saying that but you. Point number two is the idea of entropy. Now, entropy is essentially this idea, in layman's terms, that everything goes from order to disorder. But the problem with that is, is that as we go on in this theory of evolution, we actually see things getting more sophisticated, more refined. So, for example, you have this sort of amorphous beginning of the universe, this sort of big bang, and then from there you have this randomness that becomes order, which gives us the things that we need to have life. That's the opposite of things destabilizing. That was a really weird way of getting to the whole second law of thermodynamics argument. All of this talk about entropy has to do with closed systems. The universe is a closed system. There's no more energy coming in from anywhere else. However, it's awfully big. So it's going to take a very, very long time for entropy to take over and bring us to the heat death. The Earth is not a closed system. There is new energy coming in all the time from the sun. That's why life is possible. That's why these arguments make no sense. Also, I just want to point out how weird it is that all of the creationists that we keep reacting to keep using the laws of science to try to prove that the laws of science don't make sense, but then also try to use those same laws of science to prove that creationism does make sense. Like, pick a team, guys. Do you believe in reality or not? We also see this in the human person, uh, where they're telling us where you're going to have destabilization of the human person through things like genetic entropy. So that's like the fourth or fifth time that he's used those words, genetic entropy. I just went to Google Scholar and typed that phrase in, and all of the results are either creationism or people calling out creationism. Because scientists don't talk about that nonsense. Creationists do. But we're also supposed to believe that we have this less sophisticated species, and they turn into more sophisticated species, which primarily or previously we can't do things like read and write and speak. We don't have these faculties, which is obviously a sign of sophistication if you compare animal, uh, humans to animals. Humans are animals. Just throwing that out there. We move too much to be plants and we're too big to be bacteria. But then we have apparently this point where we get so sophisticated, somehow in this entropy where things are destabilizing, that we actually get more sophisticated. It doesn't make any logical sense. But I'm going to throw the entropy theorist little bone here. Sometimes I think the truth of the faith actually get mixed in because the truth can't help but reveal itself. Entropy as an idea does not make sense with evolution but it actually kind of does make sense with creationism. I just want to point out how weird it is that all of the creationists that we keep reacting to keep using the laws of science to try to prove that the laws of science don't make sense, but then also try to use those same laws of science to prove that creationism does make sense. Yup. Because we believe that God created things in a state of perfection, and because of sin, things have started to destabilize morally, but we see this in the physical realm. And one of the ways we see this is when you see the ancient, uh, sort of the texts of the Old Testament, and we see the ages of the patriarchs and things before the flood, and they live for hundreds of years. Well, that sort of thing actually makes sense if your human uh, constitution is much more stable and perfected than it will be later on as sin proliferates itself through the world. And we see after God sends the flood with Noah that we don't live much longer than we do now. We, st we stopped living as long as we did in the beginning. People lived for hundreds of years, your morality affects your lifespan, and there was once a global flood. Number three is the idea of random mutation. This is pretty easy to, deb to uh, debunk. We know what random mutation looks like. 
I bet you five bucks that you don't. Random mutation looks like basically severe handicaps. You owe me five bucks. When people study cells and they have these generations of cells, and there's, a, there's a lab near Ottawa that does this, where they have these cells essentially uh, regenerating and they're you know, creating millions of generations in a very short amount of time. Whenever there's a random mutation, it actually destroys the cell line. It actually creates things that deform the cell line. Some mutations would deform the cell and cause cell death. Other mutations would benefit the cell and promote growth. Still other mutations would do nothing. We covered all these different kinds of mutations in the last episode. Natural selection isn't just random spreading of random mutations. It is non-random selection of random mutations. Beneficial mutations proliferate, deleterious mutations die out. This really isn't that hard to understand. And when we see this in people, it creates these severe disorders and handicaps that cause a lot of suffering. So we have no evidence at all. We have no evidence at all that random mutations, so-called, actually do anything beneficial to the human species. And we covered that nonsense back in the episode with Dr. Anderson. Can you drink milk? Are you older than five? If the answer to both of those questions is yes, then you have a mutation which causes lactase persistence, which is why you're able to continue to break down and tolerate lactose from milk. If you don't have that mutation, which the majority of the population of the planet does not, then you are lactase non-persistent and therefore lactose intolerant. And this is leaving out all of the obvious mutations that cause phenotypic diversity amongst humans. Skin color, eye color, hair color, height, the rate at which we accumulate fat and lean muscle. Like, these are all different examples of mutations that were beneficial to populations thousands of years ago and are now sort of seemingly randomly spread throughout the population of the globe due to immigration and genetic drift. You'd be able to understand all of this if you thought about what you were saying for like two solid seconds. Random mutations, again, seen played out. I've been to uh, an orphanage in Mexico City where children ha have very severe handicaps, mutations, birth defects. Um, and it's very sad. Uh, I've spent lots of time with them, and it is the furthest thing from, let's say, a physical improvement to the human person. There is a great spiritual benefit in being around handicapped peoples. And we ought to advocate against eugenics and abortion because they seek to eradicate these people who are also God's children, and it makes me sick. But we cannot say that random mutation actually does anything to evolve the human species. Yeah, I was going to let the whole Mexican orphanage story slide because I, too, have pointed to the pain and the plights of different people to make arguments about morality and the like. But then you took it about three steps too far by leveraging the suffering of disabled orphan children to paint them all as these diseased mutants in order to prop up your insane argument that all mutations are bad. And then to top it off, you lumped in abortion with eugenics to make a brainless, underhanded political point for no reason. Shame on you for what you just did. You know, for example, people will say, well, this is an idea of random mutation or random things happening. You know, you put a million monkeys in front of a million typewriters and after a million years, you get them writing Shakespeare. Well, this is a fun little experiment, but it's never going to happen. But also you're forgetting the fact that the typewriter already exists and that typewriter is made by an intelligent mind and it has an ordered way of operating. You can only do English letters and you have to do them a certain way. The language already exists. There's nothing random about that. That was a really long and drawn out way to just say that you don't understand how metaphors work. Your cereal box will never jump out of your cupboard, pour itself into your bowl, and the milk will not walk out and, and, and pour itself on top. I don't care if you give it 50 bazillion, trillion, gajillion years. Something like that, randomly, is never going to happen. Fortunately, nobody's saying that but you. Yep. Point number four. We're going to call this just inconvenient truths. There's a bunch of inconvenient truths that tend to go against the evolutionary narrative, many of them historical. First one, there was a dinosaur bone discovered, Tyrannosaurus rex, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it was from Death Valley, that's a famous place in the Midwestern United States. The dinosaur bone story essentially goes like this. A woman named Mary Schweitzer 
completely German background. She was raised evangelical Christian, went off to university, discovered the big bad theory of evolution and became an agnostic. So she was a skeptic of the uh, traditional uh, Christian dating of all these things. She sort of rejected it, which is important for the story. She's discovering in this place where there's tons of these dinosaur bones and essentially, uh, through a series of events of having to move one bone, they ended up slicing it in half. I don't know why they do this, but apparently they do this for research. Anyway, she ends up finding within the bone something that looks like organic tissue. I would stop there for a second. It's impossible, given carbon dating norms that we've been given by the powers that be in the scientific community, that organic tissue could be preserved for such a long period of time, especially in the, in the uh, inside of a fossil. So this was inside the fossil, okay? You know what's funny? You were right when you said that Dr. Schweitzer was a young earth creationist and that she let go of a lot of those beliefs when she studied science and learned about reality. What you didn't get right was that she still calls herself a complete and total Christian. And she still understands evolution. And she still understands the age of the earth. And she has said in interviews that she hates it when creationists hijack and misinterpret her research exactly like how you're doing. She is not your poster child. She is as against you on this as I am. There's also other interesting animals, inconvenient truths, that is, these animals. There's something called the coelocanth, if I'm pronouncing that right, fish. Apparently this fish survived the great extinction event of what happened supposedly 60 to 80 million years ago, but this fish has not changed its structure whatsoever even though we're supposed to think that evolution is something that continually happens. Crocodilians haven't changed in over 200 million years because that's how selection pressure works. Evolution doesn't mean that something's just randomly constantly changing all the time. You keep showing over and over again that you don't know the first thing about the thing that you're trying to argue against and debunk. Bad strategy, dude. They tell us, for example, that 100,000 years is enough in, in human uh, ancestors to have major leaps in cognitive ability and structure. But for some reason, we have this 80 million year old fish that hasn't changed in 80 million years. How does that make sense? No, we don't. The major leaps towards human brain development took almost 3 million years. You also have the lungfish. Because you have to remember, this idea of evolution is essentially that you have the survival of the fittest. So these things are supposed to make sense for survival and thriving of a species. Look up the lungfish. I won't bore you with it too much right here. But look up the lungfish. It basically turns itself into mud somehow. What? And stops breathing and has a heartbeat every few weeks or months for a time. Might be a series of days. The point is, it doesn't fit reality. And then at a certain point, it sort of gets rehydrated and goes back into the water when these, you know, these rising levels of water in these, these hot places in Africa. How does that make any sense evolutionarily? It's called torpor. Dozens and dozens of animals do it. It's the main part of hibernation. There are species that have one heartbeat per minute and take one breath every 20 minutes during torpor. It is something that is well documented and understood. Just because you don't understand something doesn't mean that it's magic. Also, I can't believe I have to say this, no fish turns into mud. And camels also fit this as well. Camels go weeks or long periods of time without drinking water. No animal would ever do that voluntarily. Watch what happens to animals. If their environment is out of resources, they migrate and go somewhere else. So for some reason, the camel, I guess maybe the camel is very stubborn, apparently, according to evolutionists, and it decided to go just further out into the desert until it got really thirsty, push a little bit further, and go back and get a bunch of water. And they just decided to do that consciously, what, for generations? Okay, seriously, real talk. If you're watching this and you never had the opportunity to learn about science, that's fine. And you think that this dude is making even one tiny fraction of sense here. He is not. That is not how evolution works at all. There was never once a camel that just decided to trek out into the desert and see how long they could go without water and generation after generation just stubbornly decided to not drink anymore until they willed themselves into evolving a hump. 
That makes no sense. That is insanity. Camels use the exact same fat metabolism system that all other mammals use to store water and nutrients for times of drought and famine. They just do it a lot more. They are specialists. They took a system that was already there and they leaned into it real hard and got super duper good at it because that's what their environment demanded. Nothing evolves on purpose. They are adapting to their environment over millions of years. If this dude spent half the time that he spends styling his beard on learning, and I mean this sincerely, the first thing about how evolution works, he would understand just how asinine what he said was. An animal like the camel would be extinct. Because what we see in lived reality with animals is that when their environment gets bad, the animals do go extinct or they go somewhere else and adapt to that new environment that they can thrive in. They don't stay in the one that kills them. That's not what happens in the basic instincts of animals. Yeah, and the Sahara Desert didn't just pop up in one lifetime, dude. Camels adapted to their environment as the environment changed over millions of years. It took millions of years for the desert to form and for the camels to evolve along with it. It's not like some horse just got crapped out into no man's land and decided to quit drinking. This dude is like the Tucker Carlson of creationists. The last point, we're gonna call this the missing link. Oh, for f***'s sake. My favorite author, G.K. Chesterton, he said, the only thing we know about the missing link is that it is in fact missing. Fun little wit there. And that he will not be missed. That's the whole, he's missing, but he won't be, mi who cares? But if we actually look into the so-called missing links, these major hominids so-called that have been found, we find a ton of fraud. For example, Piltdown Man from England. This was found, you know, over 100 years ago or so. It was actually a fraudulent skull. I believe it was mixed with bones from a chimpanzee. They even did things like, you know, add some sort of stain or painting to it and, and sanding it down to create some sort of Piltdown Man. Well, as you can imagine, the scientists uh, were so happy about this that it turned into this whole idea and they were recreating entire scenes and the rest of the skeleton from just ahead and so forth and it was a disaster. It, it was turned out to be a fraud, which you can find in the mainstream literature. Yeah, we covered this several episodes ago as well, so I'm not going to recap everything, but long story short, yes, Piltdown Man was a hoax. We don't know who did it, but an amateur paleontologist found it and jumped to a bunch of conclusions about it, and it taught us a lot of lessons, namely about racism and classism in science, but also it was better science, namely fluorine dating, that disproved it. Science corrected science. That's how it works. Do you want to talk about all the times that creationists were wrong about literally everything? Or did the goalposts only stay put on my side? There was also Peking Man from Peking, China, which is uh, a big fraud as well. Uh, somehow the bones just went missing about 50, 60 years ago, and we've never seen them since, um, which does not happen with things like this. Peking Man was lost while being moved from China to the U.S. right in the middle of World War II. You know, that whole time when there were apt to be a lot of problems with shipping and handling. Also, he wasn't a missing link. Peking Man was a Homo erectus. We have a lot of those. And one of the men who was on this research team was actually Teilhard de Chardin, who was an arch heretic in the church and a probably demon-possessed priest who spread heresies all throughout and tried to have evolution even be applied to the reality of the human soul. Did this dude actually just accuse someone of being possessed by a demon in order to form his argument? Am I dreaming? Nebraska Man. Nebraska Man was not a man. Nebraska Man was a tooth. Nebraska Man was actually the tooth of a pig. This is another one that I hear all the time. Yes, a rancher in Nebraska found a pig tooth and sent it to his buddy who was a paleontologist, and that paleontologist misidentified it as an ape tooth, and then assumed that that means that this must be a totally new species of ape. That does not mean that anybody believed them. In fact, the vast majority of scientists were very skeptical of these claims, and the whole effect that this discovery had on the scientific community 
was negligible at best. You can actually find lots of papers from this time period that mention the tooth just long enough to dismiss it as nonsense and then move on. Again, science corrected science. That's what it does. So one scientist made one mistake one time and creationists have been talking about it for over a hundred years now. This is a tired, worn out anachronism that has been debunked a million and one times and it just goes to show that you have never spent a single moment listening to any arguments that you didn't already agree with. There are more frauds as well and the last one we'll talk about real quickly here. You've heard of Lucy? Lucy was this supposed hominid found in South Africa in the 1970s or so. And I believe Lucy was named after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, if I'm not mistaken. Well, they tried to prove that Lucy was uh, some sort of in-between creature. They found something that looked like a small ape. And the researchers were so convinced that they knew how Lucy was supposed to stand that they actually ended up drilling into her hips and making her stand up straight because they said that's how she actually would have, but her fossils were distorted by the process over these hundreds of thousands of years. So again, these scientists knew much better than everyone else, and they were able to tell us what actually happened, even though they never saw it happen. Last thing I'll say about this sort of missing link, there's actually such a small amount of the actual bones of the supposed hominids that I'm, I believe you can actually, and I'm, talk, I'm not talking about all fossils, I'm talking about a small amount of the actual hominid fossils, so-called that you can actually fit them in the back of a medium to large size pickup truck. Yeah, I've talked a lot about Lucy before as well. You can go watch this video if you want to hear me go into detail about Lucy and about Piltdown Man actually, but just to summarize everything here for this guy, Lucy is not the only one of her species that we've found, nor is she even close to the most complete fossil of her species that we've found. You could throw Lucy out entirely and we would still have more than enough evidence for her species. We have fossilized footprints that are older than Lucy, so it would make less sense to say that she didn't walk upright when the species before her and the species after her did. Taphonomic processes can deform and distort fossilized bones, and I'll explain what I mean by that when you can define the word taphonomy. We have way more fossils than you think we do, and I can say that with great confidence considering all the ridiculous things that you just said. And finally, you could disregard the entire fossil record and we would still have overwhelming evidence supporting evolution. And you would know that if you weren't the laziest creationist on the planet. Call me crazy, but I'm not buying it. So these are five points. I just want to throw this out there. I did not add that sound. That is a sound that that man just made. He made that sound and he decided not to do a take two. So, so, so. Well, that was incredibly stupid. I give this guy a science teacher challenge level one out of 10. I would give him a zero, but he did use words. So I guess he's got that going on for him. Uh, if you can think, you can rip this dude to shreds. There were several times throughout the course of this video where I seriously debated whether or not I should respond to what he's saying or even continue with this video at all because what he was saying was so obviously meaningless, but I figured it'd be better to really illuminate just how vapid and weak this guy's, I don't wanna use the word arguments, ramblings really are. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for subscribing, and all the other stuff that you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on your way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts. If you liked this episode or you didn't like this episode, let me know why in the comments down below. I love hearing your feedback. And if you like terrible podcasts, I've got one of those linked in the description as well. Have an awesome rest of your day and never stop learning. Bye-bye.